uh, to this panel. Um, we're here to talk about uh, latest developments in California uh, on climate. Um, we've got a great panel today, so thank you for coming. Um, I want to just do a little, I, I can barely see the audience with the bright lights, like, there you are. Um, come closer if you can. So I want to just get a quick sense of uh, where you all are from. Can you folks raise your hand if you're from California, if you're based in California? Okay, a lot of Californians here. Who is from other states, other parts uh, of the U.S.? Great. And, and do we have folks from outside the U.S.? Great. So it's a nice diverse group here. Um, good to hear. Um, so um, again, welcome. Um, we've got um, three women on our panel today. Um, <laughs> And I, I want to introduce, I'll introduce them briefly, and then we're going to start with a couple uh, brief opening sets of comments, uh, talk about uh, what they're up to and latest developments, and then we're going to, I'll ask a couple questions and we'll have time for audience questions as well. So good time now to start thinking about um, audience uh, questions that you want to ask. Um, and uh, so, uh, to my left is Rajinder Sahoda. She's Assistant Division Chief at the California Air Resources Board. Um, she's responsible for management of the cap and trade program, the scoping plan, and energy policy, and uh, is a key uh, actor in the work of the Air Resources Board on their other programs, LCFS and other programs. Um, so one of the key architects, I would say, of, of California's current climate program. Um, to her left, is Kate Gordon, um, the new director of the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Um, prior to that, she was a senior advisor at the Paulson Institute, where she oversaw the uh, Risky Business Project, looking at the economic impacts of climate change on uh, the economy. She's also spent time at uh, NextGen, Center for American Progress, and the Apollo Alliance. To her left is Jenny Moffitt, She's undersecretary at the California Department of Food and Agriculture. She works with farmers and ranchers across the state on climate change, on land use, water policy, and on food security. Um, prior to that, she served on the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board, uh, the board of California, uh, CCOF is... Certified California Farmers, Organic Farmers. Organic Farmers, that's right. The American Farmland Trust and is a managing director of her family farm uh, in California, a walnut farm, I believe. Yeah. Um, so I just, on a personal note, I wanna say that I'm um, pleased and proud to moderate this panel of three uh, women who are uh, leading California's work on climate change. Um, it's, uh, 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 I think, uh, an indication of the diverse leadership that California has benefited from um, and that can help us ensure that we uh, implement effective policy that really uh, provides benefits across the economy and across the population. So uh, thank you all for coming and joining us today at the conference. Um, so uh, I want to begin with, Regina is going to give us an overview of our work uh, and, and the recent scoping plan that was issued. Great. Thank you, Peter, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I do have a few short slides, and some I will go through quickly, and some I will spend a little bit of time on but I think it would really help to set the stage for California's climate policy and the discussion that we're gonna have, and especially the key topics that both Kate and um, Jenny are going to talk about right after, after my presentation. So we've, we've got a good story in California. Since um, 2006, AB 32 was signed. Our emissions have decreased over time, and it's been stated several times today that we dropped below our 2020 emissions four years earlier than mandated by AB 32. All while our economy has grown and our footprint as individuals and per GDP has continued to decrease. Those are all good indicators that our policies are, are kicking in, we're seeing real benefits of those, and in the same time, our economy um, has not had any adverse impacts from it, this overlay of climate policy. When we think about California's climate policy, we need to understand the sources of emissions. Um, this pie chart, it's probably been seen many, many times as part of the scoping plan, shows the industrial energy and um, 
fossil <laughs> sector emissions. Bless you. Uh, what you see here is that transportation is about one third of, or 37% of the emissions, but half of the industrial emissions are coming from oil and gas extraction and from refining of fuels that end up on our, in our vehicles on the road. So in total, California's greenhouse gas emissions, almost 50% of the fossil emissions are coming from transportation here. What you also see on the pie chart on the right is that the majority of emissions in California are CO2. That is combustion of fossil fuels. And we do have some high global warming gases, the high radiative forcing gases, and we do have targeted policies such as the short-lived climate pollutant plan to address those sources. But the majority of our emissions are from the consumption and the production of fossil fuel energy in the state. What is not on this pie chart is the natural working lands. And what I need to let, you know, you know what I wanna share about that is the stored carbon in our natural working lands, in our forests, is twice what is in our inventory of 430, about 429 there for the fossil side. So what's stored in our trees is double what is actually uh, comprising our fossil emissions for 2016. And that's, that's an important fact to remember for some of the discussion we'll have today. Um, California has always had a portfolio approach to its climate policies, and that is a mix of incentives, carbon pricing, and direct regulations. Um, there is evidence coming out in the latest IPCC report that was published last fall that this kind of mixing of policies allows for cost-effective um, paths to deeper decarbonization. Um, there's always been a discussion about how much should we do with carbon pricing, it's more uh, effective from an economical perspective, but what we're seeing is evidence that a mix of policies is actually more cost-effective and can allow for deeper decarbonization. Um, California, since 2008, has had this approach from the very first scoping plan. And through every scoping plan, the 2008 one, version, the 2013 version, and the most recent one adopted in 2017, we've continued that approach of looking for incentives and looking at carbon pricing and our direct policies. When we think about the path forward, what we're really thinking about is the concept of carbon neutrality. And that is essentially your sources of emissions equal your sink of emissions in the state. Um, the IPCC report talks about mid-century uh, to achieve globally for carbon neutrality to make sure that we avoid uh, exceeding 1.5 degrees of warming. And in California, we talk about carbon neutrality by mid-century uh, as well, by 2045, on a smaller scale, which is the California footprint. And it's in that framing that we actually start to really push our natural working lands into the bigger conversation, which has always been about mitigation and reducing the fossil side. And so now we have an opportunity to really think about both sides of the equation in a construct that we ha didn't have historically when we first started with AB32, which was just mitigate the fossil side. So what does this mean? Well, in California today, our inventory currently is, again, the fossil sources of energy and combustion and manufacturing. Um, and we do have emissions coming off of our natural working lands. Our natural working lands today in total are not a sink. Um, we see emissions resulting from land conversion. We see emissions from wildfires. What we want to uh, work towards is minimizing, continuing to minimize those emissions in the fossil sectors. Just because we have opportunities to sequester carbon or uh, capture carbon directly from the atmosphere doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to reduce those other emissions. We still need to see transformation in the way that we produce and use energy and the way that we produce goods and, and transport goods throughout the state. What it means for the natural working land is transitioning those, those sources of emissions today to be sinks um, with a net See, uh, a net uh, zeroing out of those emissions. We don't have the answer for this today, but that is really what we're working towards, um, and that is what we have started doing workshops uh, in, in, in at, sorry, that is what we have been wor doing workshops towards at the Air Resources Board, starting the conversation with a webinar in January, and then looking at the other activities going on, along at the other state agencies, and how we can think about putting this, this discussion and story together. This is not in terms of a report that we're going to put out anytime soon. This is doing our homework and setting the conversation and starting the technical work, the policy discussions, the community discussions, the academic discussions 
for the next scoping plan, which is currently slated to be about 2021, 2022. So there are some questions that we need to ask ourselves when we think of carbon neutrality for California. You know, how much more can we decarbonize our fossil sectors um, and, indu and industrial sectors? What is the long-term potential of resilient storage or natural re resilient forests to store and sequester carbon in the state? Um, what are the options for additional uh, sequestration, mechanical sequestration like CCS or direct air capture? And again, the question of an optimal mix of carbon pricing with complementary policies. Um, at the very beginning in 2008, the cap and trade program played a really small, uh, relatively small role towards achieving the 2020 target. When we look at it for 2030, it, it actually takes on a larger role towards achieving the 2030 target. What tools do we have to assess the economic and environmental impacts of the different scenarios to get to 2030? Um, and then how do we make sure that we address questions around affordability? There's a lot of discussion going on in the state about housing, the costs of living, um, and you know, there's energy, there's a, there was an article that just came out this week about in, uh, increases in energy rates uh, by the utility in Northern California. All of these are leading to a broader discussion about affordability. How do we design and how do we implement these programs in a way that do not exacerbate that existing issue in California for residents and people who wanna live in California? So what does 2019 look like for us? Well, we started off with a webinar. We've had a bioresources economy summit in January. We will be holding workshops uh, throughout the year on energy demand and supply, uh, transformation across all the economic sectors, such as transportation, industrial, and, and options to support sequestration. We want to continue our collaboration with other states and with agencies and our sister agencies. Um, we want to engage with academics and researchers and we wanna engage internationally to learn from others. So moving from the scoping plan for 2017, we're already, we've already started to put those regulations, those programs into place. We need to keep monitoring those and we need to make sure that we're ready to adjust those as needed to make sure we're on target to 2030. But because of the urgency of climate change, we are already looking at what more can we do and how fast can we do it, but being mindful of the fact that we want to avoid um, any disproportionate impacts to our communities, whether it's affordability or air quality or public safety or health, but also in a way that makes the programs that we do and the approach that we take attractive for others to use. And so these are exportable policies that can be replicated elsewhere. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, great, I'm Kate Gordon and I'm not going to use slides just uh, uh, because I'm not. Um, so I run uh, the governor's office of planning and research, which is uh, for those who know the US federal system, sort of like what the councils, like the Council on Environmental Quality or the National Economic Council are to the president's office. It's within the governor's office. Our staff is part of the governor's staff. I also have a dual role as the governor's senior advisor on climate change. So uh, able in those two roles to do a fair amount of sort of thinking about uh, what is this day gonna look like in the next several decades? How do we think about the integration of our climate policies? Uh, and energy policies into that kind of growth scenario. And then we particularly at OPR focus on uh, the intersection of policy with land use. We are the agency that, or the organization that runs um, the CEQA process, the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, we, we, we set those guidelines, we set the general plan guidelines. So we do a lot of work with local planners and local governments. Um, and uh, we do a lot of sort of guidance around how local regions and cities plan. And it's interesting, to me, it's a, Regender did such a great job of giving the framework of why, where California has come in terms of setting really ambitious goals around our carbon emissions reduction. So looking at this global emissions picture or the carbon budget or however you wanna think of it, taking California out and sort of saying, what is our responsibility? What do we need to do within that, that budget? That framework is incredibly helpful and it gives us the foundation from which to kind of plan, how are we then going to you know, build housing, build transportation, think about our economic growth strategy, think about our workforce strategy, think about our natural and working lands, where are we doing conservation, where are we doing development? And my office is sort of the center of all of that. Um, coming in this administration, it's been a really interesting, and I, I almost think this is sort of symptomatic of a global shift. Paris also, the Paris Agreement set a global framework similarly for really ambitious goals 
for uh, countries to, to achieve, and then within that, the countries are doing their, their NDCs. California was a little ahead of that because we'd already sort of done our plan um, and are always improving on it. But it, it feels like a moment where we're all switching globally and in California from sort of ambition and goals to action and implementation. And Governor Newsom really embodies that. His approach to these issues is absolutely one of how, do we, how does this work on the ground? Show me the tough issues. Show me the places where we need to work harder. And let's figure out how to get it done. Um, that is, uh, is really exciting, I think, to all of us in the administration. And I'll just talk about a couple areas where we're really seeing that integration of kind of economic um, and, and economic growth, sustainable economic growth, and, and our climate goals. Um, one of those, well, not even just one of them, sort of the whole administration from day one, I think it was the first week uh, just before he, after he'd gotten elected, before he came into office, the paradise, the campfire happened in paradise. Uh, the first, and of course, Governor Newsom was there with then Governor Brown and with the president, um, looking at the damage from that fire. The first week of the administration, um, PG&E declared bankruptcy. So the combination of the fires and the fire season that we had in 2018, which was the most serious fire season we've ever had by far, and the bankruptcy of one of our biggest of our biggest utility and the intersection of those two things with sort of all the other things that we've been dealing with as a state has really defined the first hundred days of the administration um, what we see i think that the fires are really important because they're 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 symptomatic of the immediate impact and acute impacts that we're feeling from climate change already so i think for for maybe decades we've sort of been thinking of oh, there's the physical climate impact stuff over here, and we're gonna have to worry about that, and we're gonna have to do adaptation. And then over here, there's the, all of the important prog programs we're doing to reduce our, our, to reduce our emissions and like, look out to our future impacts. We, those two things have come crashing together um, this year, and I think for many places, whether it's because of drought patterns, whether it's because of fires, whether it's because of sea, you know, sea level rise, it's flooding, it's, all, it's storm surge, those these things have come crashing together, particularly in California, and so what we're seeing is these climate impacts, which have led to a cycle where we have you know, precipitation, we have a lot of rain, and then we have a little bit of rain, we have drought, we have rain. When we get rain, all of our vegetation grows really quickly, and then there it all is, ready to be dried out when we have a drought cycle. We also have increased bugs and the boar beetles coming in and killing off the trees, which also leads to extremely flammable forests, right? So we have that going on over here coupled with, so the climate crisis over here, coupled with an affordability crisis in California, which has forced more and more people to leave our more urban areas and try to find housing that's affordable wherever they can, particularly older people on fixed incomes. So people moving out of cities and into places like Paradise, where a two bedroom home was $800 a month. You cannot find that in most of California. So we've got this fires, increased risk from climate change, increased risk from the affordability crisis, people moving into these areas, so more and more built structures. All of that combined with, um, you know, co combined with the sort of third thing, which is that we require, as everybody does, who has regulated utilities, we require all those people to get service from the utilities. So combined with a whole bunch of power lines. And all those things together created this perfect storm of high wind, high drought, fire risk, structure risk, human risk. 75% uh, of those who died in the campfire were over 65. People who were socially isolated, geographically isolated, could not get out of their homes. Paradise was a place that had done fire evacuation drills. It would have been a lot worse had they not done that, had they not cleared most of those excess r exit routes. But I think the governor really sees and we really see the fires as sort of a microcosm of this issue of these two major crises that are affecting California and much of the world, which is the affordability and inequality crisis meeting up with the climate crisis. So, so they've, they've, they've kind of come together and what we've done as an administration around fires is a few things. First of all, a very, very quick plan to try to get to the most vulnerable communities. We've, Cal Fire has identified, which is our state fire agency, has identified 35 core areas to start putting money now into fire um, management, forest management, which is a really interesting whole panel on its own of the forest management conversation. So, so really getting some of the wood out of the forest, trying, trying to clear a little bit, trying to make, um, 
do home hardening and to make those homes more safe. And then we've also done, the legislature set up a commission called the Catastrophic Wildfire Commission, which my office runs, to try to get at some of the longer term cost and liability structures to figure out what do we do about this problem of having utilities in places with fire. And then uh, the governor himself asked an energy strike force, which I was a, a part of, to come up with a 60 day plan to sort of attack a bunch of the elements of the fire situation. And I'm going into detail on this because it really is a place where everything we're talking about comes together. It's um, the, the plan that we came up with, the 60 day plan, goes into the fire risk thing I just talked about, but it also goes into the state's clean energy goals, our mitigation goals, and the question, and we'll talk more about this later, the question of how are those at risk potentially from things like the fires? When we have utilities go bankrupt, our long-term power purchase agreements with renewable energy companies are at risk. How do we meet our goals when that happens, right? It's a very real world problem. Uh, we also then go into sort of the role of the PUC and the changing nature of utilities in general, which many of us are looking at. How are we thinking about poles and wires companies and what's the future for utilities and how does the future of distributed energy fit into the climate goals that we've all spent so many years developing? So I would say that we've really spent a lot of time in the beginning of the administration just focusing on these, you know, kind of dealing with this crisis and focusing on how do we how do we get at it um, uh, in an implementation way? The last thing I'll say before I stop on this is the other big piece I talked about the climate crisis and the fires as a microcosm. The fire is also the microcosm of the affordability crisis. The governor has been very, very strong on the need for California to build more housing and to address our affordability crisis. And I bring that up because I think often governments really silo that out too. It's like, oh, you're the housing agency, you're the transportation agency, and we do climate over here. As Rajinder just said, um, transportation is with, with extraction and refining and, tra and, and movement of goods, it's 51, I think, percent 51. of our emissions in the state of California. It's also the second, transportation is the second biggest bill for most households in California after housing. We, uh, and, if, and the slide wasn't in Regender slides, but you can see it in, this, in the um, report that, the, uh, that CARB put out in December on, on sustainable communities. The, the place that we're not going down on emissions but going up is on vehicle miles traveled, is on how much people are driving to get to home, to get to work, to get to school, to get to healthcare. So the other big piece of the puzzle for us um, in this administration is how do we marry those housing goals, which are critical, to the need to do development generally more sustainably in California, and how do we do that in a state that's expected to get to 50 million people by 2050? So in some ways, it's our sustainable urbanization challenge that we often think of as a China and an India challenge, but it's really a California challenge as well, and we're spending a lot of time thinking about the integration of that need to develop more housing with the reality of these high fire risk areas and the reality of something Jenny, I'm sure, is gonna talk about, which is the need to conserve valuable agricultural land and other conservation land. Um, and how do we balance all that out in California while we're trying to reach these ambitious goals? So it's, it, it is not easy, but, um, but it's a lot of incredibly important pieces that I think are really, the governor really is integrating into a coherent strategy. And I will stop there. Okay, so I do have a couple slides. Um, yeah, I think it's a great segue into um, really talking about a, a very discrete area where we've been doing some work. The 2017 scoping plan directed, um, the Air Resources Board directed the Department of Food and Agriculture, the Air Resources Board, the Natural Resources Agency, and Cal EPA to really start to dive into carbon within our natural and working lands. Um, talking about fire, talking about forestry management, all of those different conversations. Um, and so I'm gonna do just a quick update if I don't turn off this. We'll see if I, there okay, go. there we go. Good job. Um, so this is, uh, so we had these conversations, we had workshops, we really engaged with um, a lot in, in both the agriculture, the forestry, the ranching, um, the habitat arena on what, what are some ways in which the state can play a role in our land base, in our landscape, in our working lands? Um, how can we be at the table in, in much more of a forefront way through these conversations, certainly in plans, and what does is, what is our plan look like as far as a natural and working lands plan? Um, but then also in our programs and our strategies and um, in the direction that we can, through policies, really start to drive change within that landscape, um, really starting to look at those fires, look at um, ag land in a whole new light as, as part of the climate solution and also part of, and an important part of our economy as well. 
so in January, we released this draft report uh, where we really started to talk about um, what are, where are ways in which we can increase restoration, increase management on our lands, and this is what we came up with on cultivated and, and agricultural lands um, and range lands, five times the state intervention in soil conservation practices for forested lands, two times the pace and scale of forest managed. I think we're going to really start to see now especially um, a, a big increase in, in those goals as well. Um, savannas and woodlands, wet, wetlands, you can kind of read them from there. Uh, but this was really just our, the first time the state put something down on paper and said, this is the role that our natural and working lands can play in the climate arena. Um, it's, I think, a really important stake to put down in the ground um, as we now start to talk about neutrality, what that means as far as carbon neutrality, where can we really start to now kickstart the conversations yet again on the role of our landscape, our land base, in achieving our neutrality goals for 2045. Um, for agriculture, it's interesting, we talk about land conservation a lot, so the, the U.S. Census for Agriculture just came out a couple weeks ago, it comes out every five years, Normally, I say that we have 25 million acres of agricultural land in the state. And that I say that because there's such a potential in our agricultural lands. Um, we have a lot of ag land in the state, so we have a huge potential for management of those lands in ways that, um, that we're sequestering carbon, both in our grasses, in our, um, in our trees, and in our soils. Um, unfortunately, with the, the new census out, I now have to say we have 24 million acres of ag land in the state. Mm -hmm. We've lost a million acres of ag land um, since the last census came out. Uh, I haven't delved into a lot of why, um, but we certainly have had drought and water management that has really driven and changed a lot of, of our land. During the drought, we had 500,000 acres of land that had been fallowed. And so that's also part of the conversation as we think about water management in the state and of course the impact on climate change but also how are we achieving sustainability in our groundwater basins in the state that's going to change the landscape in many areas in the state from previously irrigated lands to non-irrigated lands and what are the potential as we do change those landscapes to increase biodiversity in the state to increase habitat to really convert those lands into um, into potential as well um, so yeah, we have 24 million acres. So this is just, uh, the goal here is really just on state funded intervention. Um, but you can see the potential for carbon storage in just the soils. This is just really the soils and perhaps on farm hedgerows. So some woody material, but definitely not orchards, any of that matter. Um, so there's a lot of potential for, um, for soil and soil carbon sequestration. There's actually more carbon sequestration in the soils than there is in the atmosphere combined. Uh, so the soils play a huge role in that, that part of the solution. And I'll just tub tail a little bit on, this is, I just have this slide here because we talk about all of the different, the suite of agricultural product things that we have. Regender talked briefly about methane and short-lived climate pollutants, our dairy digester program that we have at our department and our alternative mineral management program are part of the working landscape. They're part of our lands and they're part of the solution in really achieving our methane reductions that we need to get to where we need to be for, for climate, our carbon emissions. Um, but then there's all these other programs as well that have multiple benefits, water efficiency, um, land conservation. Uh, the farmer program is engine replacement, so it's not only meeting our climate goals, but also air quality goals, especially in really critical areas of the Central Valley that need that. Um, but what I really, really wanted to talk about is the Healthy Soils Initiative and our program that we have at the state. We'll ha there's a panel tomorrow that's really going to dive more into the science of it. I'm not going to touch on that. But really, it's, it's where, as we as a state, as we think about our natural and working lands, and then I'm just going to dive into to soils, um, and, and I'm going to avoid the, you know, the forest because we've covered that already. But where, how can we as a state say, this is our goal, and now... How are we partnering with industry in achieving that goal? Um, so the Healthy Soils Initiative that we have at the state is a three-pronged effort. It's financial incentives, so it's investing directly with farmers and ranchers. It's also investing 
and demonstration projects so we can show the results of, of management practices. And when we talk about healthy soils, we're talking about things like compost application on cropland and rangeland that is building that soil and the building soil carbon, the soil organic matter to not only grow more productive food, but also to, um, to sequester that carbon. It's putting things like cover crop, hedgerows, those sorts of no-till, uh, so different on-farm management practices. The second is policy. What are the policy drivers that we have that might be getting in the way? So we have a lot of water management, the irrigated lands management program, um, and other policy drivers that um, we definitely need to achieve water quality in the state. How do we do that in a way that we're also supporting farmers who are implementing more conservation programs? Um, we are very good at being able to do tailpipe emissions where it's much more of a challenge to really start to look at a natural system and address those emissions. So um, sometimes we just, you know, our policies also drive change as well. Um, and then, of course, the last one is always research and extension. This is here um, the Healthy Soils program we had last year. So as we looked at for the natural working land strategy, this is the what the seven and a half million, actually we ended up spending about five million, um, drove um, change on 8,000 acres in California. This year we have 15 million, so we'll see a huge shift. Um, but our goal, as we said, um, was really to get to 500,000 acres by 2030. So certainly we have a lot more to go, but there's a substantial amount of carbon sequestration potential um, that also is not just sequestering carbon, it's storing more water into the soil, it's managing nutrients in a way that is much more beneficial for our groundwater and for our, our, um, our streams. Um, so there's a lot of other benefits as well. Um, we recognize that technical assistance is very important, so we invested a substantial amount in really assisting farmers and really starting to develop the plans that they need to implement those practices. And then, um, but then finally, the way that I think that beyond what we're doing at the state level to invest in it, the partnerships as well. And the supply chain, we convened a bunch of folks in the supply chain, so McDonald's and General Mills and, and a lot of the, the major players who are really interested in participating um, at a summit in um, Sonoma last September and, and really started to drive that conversation of the immense potential for scalability with the supply chain. How can the supply chain start to implement carbon and um, into their purchasing power that they have? Um, what are the roles in which that they can support farmers and ranchers um, in doing that, um, either through technical support, through, of course, paying more for certain practices, but really looking at that supply chain, the consumers, the buyers, the investors in that. Um, so those are the, some of the really discrete things that we're doing just on a very, I think, a small sale sliver of, of at the state we're saying, yes, we're gonna, we have these policies, we're implementing these, we have these challenges, certainly drought in agriculture in California is part of it. Um, but then we're also taking that to the next level at the state and saying we're going to take action, we're taking action, and we're going to continue to take action as well. So it's an operational issue. That's all I've got. So it brings different people to the table in a very operational way. Well, thank you all. I want to dig a little deeper, if you will, into the issue that you mentioned. Um, you know, the convergence of these issues. I've been in the field long enough where we had the adaptation was over here and mitigation was way over here. And now there's a lot of overlap and you know, they come into office and have the campfire and PG&E's bankruptcy occur in close succession. You know, maybe the good news is you don't have a lot of problems. We've got one big problem. Or the um, sector, or yeah, we've got an affordability we're problem, we've got a climate silos, problem, right? we've got so, like, a housing we're problem, we've got a transportation problem, and they're all over here, and, resources over here, and uh, we're set up to have and, um, those totally different conversations. I guess, uh, and so you know, one of the things that we as think as an administration are, are really trying how, how to do that is to start to integrate uh, that conversation. Like these specifically issues among and staff and try to get the budget to be a little for, more integrated. Solutions um, and that's been mind. super challenging. I mean, affect, I won't lie. It's, it's, uh, it's a hard thing to do. But part of it, I think, is that narrative yeah, no, it's that a, it's a good this question. isn't I think a separate it's, um, issue. Like the impacts are not a separate issue and the opportunities thing, to bring down emissions are not a separate that issue. One thing that all part of our sort of sustainable economic growth strategy. And the economy. A little bit to add on to that, really, it's all of our issue is 
is invasive pests, whether they're invasive insects, invasive um, weed, plant species. Um, they are something that we work on on a daily basis at the Department of Food and Agriculture. So invasive species that are coming, um, that were now that have been in Mexico or other areas that are now coming into the state, um, either be through transportation routes or because our climate is changing and there's more climate that is um, that they're adapted to. Certainly our winter chill has changed a lot in the state. So normally we could um, eradicate or have, a, I guess, a break in invasive pest species. Um, and now with climate change, that's, that's shifting everything. Um, so a lot of the work that we're doing on our plant and pest um, invasive species is I think a big example of that. And then of course, weed species and what that means for fires as well. Uh, but shaho borer is of course a problem in our forests. It's also a huge problem in avocados. Yeah. Um, so they do transfer um, certainly within agriculture and, and the rest of our landscape as well. And, and I'll just add on to a point that you made, Kate. When we had the 2008 scoping plan, it was all the agencies that had a piece of the economy-wide you know, industrial energy sectors. Believe it or not, we all had a conversation about how to set up the scoping plan so that each agency knew what its area was. So that's why you have the electricity sector, industrial sector, transportation sector, the recycling sectors, all of those were designated so every agency knew exactly what its boundaries were and they could focus on those. And we've stuck to that construct about, they're, they're called the scoping plan sectors, and that's from 2008. They're very, very discrete sectors for very discrete agencies and efforts. And what's happened over time, starting with the 2013 scoping plan with short-lived climate pollutants, the super pollutants, and the more recent scoping plan is, because we are seeing the impacts of climate change, because they are manifesting across so many different areas and in so many different discussions and forms that are, and different ways that they're affecting people's lives and the way that we um, produce goods and the way that our economy is set up, you're seeing an integration. In the last 2017 scoping plan, we had almost two dozen state agencies actually part of that process. The very first workshop for that scoping plan um, had every agency at the table on those issues to talk about it. And so you're seeing this culture shift within the state um, agencies and the structure, which is gonna continue, which is this recognition that we are not siloed and being siloed is not the way the real world works. And so that's, and, and just seeing that in the way three scoping plans were, were completed is fascinating when we, when we think about the points about it's all coming together. So I want to make sure we have some time for some audience questions. Uh, does anybody have a question? I've got a couple more if you don't. <laughs> uh, just get those ready. Um, so, oh, oh, great. Come on up. There's a microphone right here. Hi. Um, thank you very much. Could you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Susan Wood, um, Argus Media, Denton's. Um, basically work for myself and do a lot, wear a lot of hats, but I, I'm, I'm interested in the focus on you know, forestry and uh, grasslands and credits like that, um, and I was curious what your thoughts are on the recent controversy or issues surrounding the leakage aspect um, with some of the forestry, with the forestry protocol that's currently going on. Um, sure, and I'm happy to take that one because I think this is in reference to the offset protocol for the cap and trade program. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'll begin by saying the offset program and the cap and trade program do provide critical incentive funding to the natural working lands. When we talk about the, cli the California Climate Investments Programs, the slide that Jenny had about the different areas that we have mitigation and funding, that is the cap and trade auction revenue that comes in from the sale of allowances. And then the incentive programs, um, you know, we, I think we heard earlier from Javier from the Yurok tribe, which is a California tribe. That is an offset project that's in Northern California. And so the cap and trade program itself has multiple mechanisms to support the work that's happening in the natural working lands, including some of the new work that's happening with um, Cal Fire in identifying regions where they want the 35 risk zones. Um, the recent controversy about the offset protocol really I, I, it's unfortunate that that story keeps coming up only because there's um, a researcher at Berkeley who has for a long time had a very personal issue with the cap and trade program and a personal issue with the offset program. And what she essentially does is takes a study about oranges 
finds that or study about oranges and applies it to apples. And at the surface, they look like fruit compared to fruit, but when you dig one level deeper, you understand that that study that she's using to make the, make the jump and make the conclusion that the offsets in the California program aren't real, that study is inappropriate and being misused to actually try and critique and undermine the credibility of the offset program and the offset protocol. Um, and so I think Jason spoke to it in an earlier panel. We're happy to engage on this on a more technical level, but really it's, it's founded on some very misleading information and inappropriate relationships that shouldn't be made between two limited studies and our protocol. They're not the same. And just at a little bit of a higher level on natural working lands and just carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration is, as we know, from the IPCC 1.5 report, a critical piece of meeting our global climate right. goals. We cannot not do it at this point. This is a massive part of the solution. And, and unfortunately, it's not, negative emissions are not priced at a level where most people managing mm -hmm. lands can do them without some kind of additional incentive. It's very, very hard to say, oh, if you do low till or no till, it will all work out because you'll be more productive. You'll be more productive, but it takes time to be more productive and it doesn't necessarily pencil out in the first couple of years. So it is something where I think we're all looking, the low carbon fuel standard has a CCS incentive. The federal tax bill has 45Q, which is a federal incentive. There are incentives all over the place, but, but the reality is most of the people doing this work today and showing us how it can be done are doing it because of the offset program, or uh, whether it's here or in other mm -hmm. countries. And it really does serve an important purpose. It needs to be done well, but it is a way that you can essentially give landowners the ability to get value from farming carbon or sequestering carbon, which does not exist in most parts yep. of the world. That's, mm -hmm. that's right. Anything to No. Um, Taking your case for you. <laughs> Go, carbon <laughs> sequestration. Did I like carbon sequestration. <laughs> so I think we're short on time. Which Peter, is, there's sorry, a question. Peter. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, there's a question. Was there another question? Great. If we all talk too much. We know this about ourselves. <laughs> we started a little late, too. So. Hi, uh, I'm Laurence. I'm from UC Berkeley. Um, so we've been talking about these studies that um, are misleading or are supposed to be misleading. Um, is there any study that backs the 20% leakage rate that ARB has been using for many years? Yes, absolutely. In our rulemaking record and in the lawsuit that we prevailed on where this issue was coming up, and the additionality issue, all of those issues came up. We have a long rulemaking record that points to all the resources for where we got um, those leakage factors and how our protocol is developed. And in fact, this just goes back to the way that the robust, the robust policy making that happens at regulatory agencies in California. We spent multiple years of public engagement with scientists, with stakeholders, with members of the legislature, within the administration before we adopted those protocols, making sure we had the best science and concurrence on the science before we put those protocols out. And, uh, and since that time, we've actually updated that protocol twice. And so we're gonna be doing periodic reviews of our protocols again, again, looking for the best science, but having that conversation so that everyone can participate in it. And, and so every, you, of course, and anybody else that's interested is welcome to be part of that conversation. But really, we, we feel that we've done the best job in relying on the best science and the lawsuit, prevailing in the lawsuit supports that. Thank you. So I want to um, I want to close on a high note, on a positive note, um, because there's a lot of good things going out there. And I'm wondering if you if there's anything um, uh, that's really encouraging on on the climate front that's caught your attention lately. Um, I'll just start because uh, it's something that uh, NRDC has been active on. Um, the Nevada legislature uh, passed the 50% RPS mm -hmm. Renewable Portfolio Standard Bill, and it was voted out of the legislature unanimously. There wasn't a single no vote on that signed by the governor. Fantastic. I think just yesterday. Um, so some good news, and uh, I wanted to open that up to see if there's uh, anything else that caught your attention lately. I, I, I can say that, you know, California, the suite of policies that we have in California, the low carbon fuel standard, the RPS program, our SLCP programs, sustainable planning programs, advanced clean cars, carbon pricing, they're seen as a toolkit for other jurisdictions. And while this mix may, not, may be great for California and we need to monitor and adjust as time goes on, other jurisdictions are looking at pieces of the toolkit in California, taking those, applying those, tweaking those for their own needs. 
we see LCFS being picked up by Federal Canada and Brazil is looking at it. LCFS is in Oregon. RPS is across, I think, over a dozen states in the US right now. The Transportation Climate Initiative is convening one of their first meetings next week in Boston to look at cap and invest for the transportation sector. So when we see, and it's not about seeing all of California's policies taken as a whole, but we recognize that there are policies in California that are being picked up and actually adopted and put in place in other regions. And that is an amazing, an amazing feat to see when we've been slogging away for so long to now see the pieces getting picked up and propagating elsewhere. Absolutely. Great, and I, I'll just build on that and say, I think to me it's really encouraging to see this recognition, and I actually do credit the sort of Paris Agreement framework in some ways on this, this recognition that these solutions are extremely local. Climate impacts are very local and solutions are very local, and now we're seeing these jurisdictions all over the country and the world come to different mixes of solutions that, feed, that meet their local culture, local economy, local energy mix. Not everywhere is California. We have an extraordinarily urban legislature and we have a temperate climate and we don't have any coal. So there are things about us that are not like other places mm -hmm. and there are things about us that can be replicated. I'm particularly excited about two, well, three things. One, New Mexico, which is a big gas state. I mean, they're because they just surpassed us actually in oil and gas production, but had the new governors put a really amazing suite of policies in place there on, on energy and including some really important safety stuff around the gas industry. Uh, I'm encouraged by Idaho, which actually has been looking at the climate impacts on its hydro production, which is 80% of, of, of Idaho's energy, noticing that their hydro is, very, is becoming increasingly variable because of precipitation impacts, and thinking about backing that up with renewables because it's a less volatile uh, set of industries. That's very cool. They came to it from a totally different place than we did, but it's really important. And then, you know, I'm an urban person, so congestion pricing in New York, I think. They're finally doing congestion pricing, and I think it's super exciting. In L.A., too, doing congestion pricing. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> so I'm really encouraged by the farmers and ranchers in California who are really stepping up to the plate in the um, SB 32 climate conversations two years ago. Ag was at the table, part mm -hmm. of the discussions, yep. and, um, and Ag is staying at the table. The interest from farmers and ranchers in our climate programs and applying for and you know writing about the work that they're doing on climate change is really encouraging. Ag sees the role and the potential in being at the table and being part of the climate conversation, not only because climate change is definitely impacting ag, but because it's a new opportunity for ag to play a role in stewardship. And as one thing I, I'm super encouraged by yesterday is we're always at the Department of Food and Ag trying to make that connection of food and ag, connecting the eaters with the producers and having those conversations so people are much more connected with their food source. And so yesterday we announced a launch of a partnership with um, the restaurant industry and folks in the restaurant industry who are really starting to look at adding a, a, a new line item to the, to the bills where consumers can actually pay into a fund that is going directly to farmers and ranchers for carbon farming. So we announced that yesterday um, with the um, Restore California, which is the restaurant initiative, and we're really excited about the opportunity there in the restaurant industry to start to really connect those eaters and those producers in a much more holistic way around climate change. What, what's that called? It's called Restore California. Great. Awesome. Yeah. It's a good deal. Well, with Super that, um, we're out of time. I want to thank all three of you for coming and joining us uh, yeah. and sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, yeah. I enjoyed it. I hope everybody in the audience did as well. Um, appreciate it. Thank you all for coming as well. Yeah.